do. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Sunday morning. Can the church say amen? I want to make sure you're awake. Can the church say hallelujah? <laughs> hey, we got the whole family. You guys taking up a whole pew there. Nice to see you. Your hair looks flawless and beautiful. Now everybody's staring at you. <laughs> sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> um, yes, yes, yes. If you don't know the name of the person next to you, apologize for your behavior and just say hello real quick. Just make sure that everybody knows each other. We're family here. We're supposed to be family. So, and, and, if, and if you... And if you're supposed to know their name and you forgot, you can just fake it and say, I knew your name, <laughs> but just read it. So it's okay. And then repent later. So we like to do, I know that we have some people that are visiting here for the first time, and we'd like to welcome our visitors by having them all come up on stage. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't do that to you. <laughs> I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> all right. Well, let, let me get to, we are, listen, in our, in our continuation and we have some things that we want to do today. We want to pray for some of our uh, college guys that are going to be going off to school. Um, we want to pray really for anybody that's going off to school. And we have communion later on. And uh, we have some more worship. And, and I love the worship this morning, by the way. It just seems like ever since we started, uh, probably close to three months ago, there always seems to be like this intense worship, full drum set, bass, multiple, uh, you know, guitarists and a keyboard, and, and, um, and that's fine. That's great. I love it that our musicians just love to let loose, but I think it's nice just to have the simplicity of the voices sometimes being showcased, because I think sometimes we can lean on a concert-like atmosphere that creates a shallow worship unto our God. And I think it's good for us to go back and recognize that it is not about the production, but it is about people who are servants, who are talented, and who love Jesus. Amen? That's right. I loved it. In fact, you're going to come up, you're going to come up later again. So, hey, what's the time? Somebody tell me the time. 11? Okay. Oh, plenty of time. Plenty of time. My sermon is only two hours long, so, so we're good. Hey, listen. So we're conti in, our, in our continuation of what seems to be the never-ending series of A Time to Be Offensive. And, and I'm sensing in my heart that we're going to bring this to a close real soon, uh, but not today. Uh, it, it, it would be really challenging for me not to address what I believe to be one of the most encouraging and one of the most empowering and contagiously life-giving scriptures in the entire Bible. We're going to talk about that this morning. In fact, I happen to believe that this passage of Scripture, it's probably the most well-known, used, and popular passage of Scripture, both in the secular and in the Christian communities. Uh, second to, of course, John 3.16, before your mind goes there, because, you know, you can't go to a football game without somebody showing you a sign or a bumper sticker, and that's, that's cool, nothing wrong with that, but, that, but it's not that one. I use this passage of scripture when I get asked to come do youth rallies or youth camps or sometimes I have the opportunity to go in, on a, into a locker room on a Friday night before a Friday night football game and we get a chance to pray and pump everybody up. And one of the scriptures that I lean on simply because it's been an incredible source of encouragement for me personally ever since the first day I got saved. And of course, I'm talking about Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The Bible says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And that really is where I want to hang my hat on this morning. And I could just quote that scripture or we could just read that passage of verse, that verse of scripture, because that's what we really want to expound on this morning. I felt like the Holy Spirit just downloaded some things into my spirit. And I am eagerly waiting the moment to, to, to give these things to you. And it's now. The time has not yet come. But I want us to read. It's, the whole thing is so good. I, I am in love with this book, everybody. And so I thought that we would start with verse 1, even though it's rather lengthy. Some people have told me that I read too much Scripture, and that is a fault that I am okay with being guilty of, okay? Especially because I happen to know statistics. I'm not saying this is you. This is probably other churches. But statistically, the people tell us that do this for a living, that most people don't read their Bibles on a daily basis. 
In fact, if you've, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Raise your hand if you haven't read your Bible all week. You know, and so statistics tell us that this is how we function. That for most Christians, the Bible is not a daily dietary part of your Christian, you know, nu nutritional. You don't read it. <laughs> it's, what, it's what people tell us. So, so I, I, I'm sure that's probably, uh, you know, the Catholic Church, not you guys. Um, <laughs> but I thought that it's nice whenever we get a chance to read as much Scripture as we can because it's so good. If you would join me, would you just stand for a moment? And um, we're going to read this passage of Scripture together. Again, it's the book of Philippians chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 1. If you got your Bibles with you, I always encourage you not to fight battles with somebody else's sword. I feel very uncomfortable when I attend church and I don't have my Bible. I appreciate somebody letting me use theirs, but I just there's something about my Bible. Jeff was over it last week and he left his Bible in my Jeep. He's like, oh, now I guess I got to come back to church next week because I got to go. I got to pick up my Bible, you know. But if you don't have your Bible, we're going to throw it up here for you and we're going to read this. Okay, so here we go. Verse 1, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren. My joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I love how encouraging Paul is. He's such a cool cat. I implore Eudia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. I let me interrupt myself. I love the fact that Paul, that, that, that the two people that found themselves to be able to ha keep up with the Apostle Paul when it comes to the furthering of the gospel were two women. Yeah? Kind of cool. Kind of cool. I, love, and then, I read this in the, in the NIV, and it says, For these women have contended with me. I love that word. They were contenders. Help these, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I love that everybody else is just, you know who they are, but these girls, <laughs> they're special. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. When the Bible repeats itself, we should probably pay special attention because as most of us know, whether it's through a personal testimony or through the life of somebody else, nothing uh, sucks more than being depressed. <laughs> And I love that the Bible says, rejoice, always. Hold up. Let me say it again. Rejoice. All right. So let me stop interrupting myself. It's just, you see why this is so good. I mean, it's just full of meaning. None of this is, it, it's totally irrelevant to the message, by the way. Um, Let your gentleness be known to all men. I, I got to work on that one. I'm not a very gentle, kind-hearted, warm person. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. I love that the Bible tells us that when you need to pray, that you should also pray with a spirit of thanksgiving. Instead of just giving the Lord our laundry list, you know, or with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Sometimes people don't understand how you can not go crazy in going through some of the things and the trials that we go through because it surpasses understanding because by all logic, you should not be able to make it. But when the Lord carries you, it makes all the difference. Finally, brethren, and <laughs> most of you said, okay, finally, thank you. <laughs> Tired of standing. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely. I love that the past, the, okay, I can't stop myself. I'm sorry. I'm just going to give in to my own urges of allowing the Bible to speak, okay? Um, I, I love that the Apostle Paul 
I'm not sure that there has ever been a man that displays a higher level of masculinity when it comes to just furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love the language that he chooses. Whatever is lovely. <laughs> That's cool. I like that about this guy, that he's in touch with his feminine side, you know. I was just telling Linda that I hate about myself that I notice when people wax their eyebrows. I notice when they get new haircuts. I notice when they trim their, themselves, you know. I, I appreciate the fact that some people have trimmed their nose hairs and that they don't have hair coming out of their ears. I mean, and I, and I hate, and, and I wish I was the kind of person that just like, these things mean nothing to me. I want to know how your soul is. But I notice these things probably because I was raised by women with no daddy. So... <laughs> but the apostle Paul says, take notice of the things that are lovely. <laughs> Love that. Where am I at? Um, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Isn't that a good reminder? If you're like me, I tend to just choose to focus on notice the negative, you know? I could be standing and just going out of my mind because the guy in front of me did not go when the light turned green at 1.3 seconds after it happened, and I'm ignoring the fact that it's a beautiful, lovely, sunny day, okay? So <laughs> let's re refocus. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. My God, listen to that. I got to repeat that because it is just nasty good. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. The purpose of hearing the word of God and the purpose of, uh, of absorbing the word of God in our souls is not so that we can be mused by some revelation that we've never noticed on our own before when we read the passage of scripture, but it's so that we can walk out of the doors of this church and do that which we heard. Man, it just does that, everybody sees that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that you read the Bible and, you, and it, it is that clear. I, I sometimes I get, you get almost guilty about the simplicity of the things that I notice in the Bible and that I get to share them with people. So the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I love that. I learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to be abound, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's pray, Father. I ask right now, Lord, that you would allow this word to become super relevant so that we can leave this place and not just hear, but do that which we've heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for indulging me. You should try that for our leaders meeting on two, last Tuesday. I, I, uh, I shared something that I saw in the scripture I, I, I woke up one morning and I told the Lord, I just want to read your word. And I don't want to think about a message or a sermon or the team. I just want your word to flood my soul. And I turned to the book of Romans chapter 1. And I got to verse 1. And then I stopped. And I wrote like, like three pages of stuff on verse 1. So I'm still trying to make it to verse 2. We'll see when that happens. Let me give you a little historical background in what we just heard. Not for the sake of making the message longer, because actually, I, I think by my standards, the message is quite concise, but I think that it's going to be helpful for us to recognize the context in which the scriptures were being written. So we find that the time, in the, the, the reason the book of Philippians is called the book of Philippians, it was because it was a letter that was addressed by the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church. And the reason it's called 
the Philippian church, it's because it was in the city of Philippi. And the reason Philippi was called the city of Philippi, it's because it was named after a king by the name of Philip, King Philip. That bears no relevance to you other than the fact that King Philip had a son by the name of Alexander, who was later given an addendum to his name, and you and I know him as Alexander the Great. And the reason greatness was ascribed to this Alexander was because it was under, largely under the rulership and the leadership of his military endeavors that the, the Egyptian government was brought to an end. And now the major world power that was governing the known world was Rome, and it was largely due to his leadership. And I say that simply because I want you to understand that when these scriptures were written, and when Paul wrote to the Philippian church, he was writing to a group of people that were living in a culture which stood in opposition to just about every Christian belief that there was. With the Roman government came Roman culture. With Roman culture came Roman society, and with Roman society came Roman living, and the Romans lived in such a way that was really in direct opposition to everything at the core of what the Christians believed, which is why for a long time life was extremely difficult for them. For example, the Romans believed in polytheism where the Christians believed in monotheism, meaning that they believed in many gods, and the Christians believed in one and one God alone. So they lived, those Christians lived in a time and in a place in which people said, listen, you worship who you want to worship, I'll worship who I want to worship, and just don't tell me who I need to worship, because there's so many gods that we can worship uh, that we need to just be tolerant of each other's worship, and so you can pretty much worship anything or anyone that you want. Roman culture, also at that time, was a culture that was absolutely immersed and daily distracted by sport. Where the Christians believed that we should be about your father's business. The, uh, the, the, the Romans believed that you could that be, you know, they believed in sexual promiscuity. Where the Christians believed in purity. The Romans believed that it was that homosexual relationships and even pedophilia were culturally accepted, but the Christians believed that sex was reserved for a man and a woman of proper age. I could go on and on and on, but all I want to convey to you is that maybe they did not live in a time that was vastly different from where you and I find ourselves trying to live at our faith. And the reason, and the only reason I say that is because if Paul wrote to those people and say, I know you're living in a time and in a place where you're standing in direct opposition to what anything that you're hearing, everybody around you say that you can still do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if they could do it, we could do it because he, meaning God, does not change. I'm going to let you guys say amen to that by repeating that statement because I thought it was incredibly insightful. <laughs> they lived in a place similar to our place, and what I'm saying to you is that if they can do it, then we can do it because he, meaning our Lord and our Savior, does not change. Yeah. There, <laughs> there we go. That's right. That, oh, come on. Might as well everybody do it. <laughs> come on. Might as well everybody do it. Wake everybody up. <laughs> So the Bible says that I can, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength to be able. Listen, if you could just stick with the word I can, that would be an awful egotistical statement until you finish the rest of the verse and you recognize that your I can is attached to the fact that he's the one that's going to give you the strength to be able to do it. I, those two, listen, those two monosyllables are just pregnant. Pregnant with potential and with possibility. I can. Can't never could. I, I hate it when my daughters tell me that I can't. I can't. They're getting the point now because I, I, I tell them, don't even say that. The moment you begin to say you can't, you've already lost whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. My Frankie has a really hard time with it. I can't. And she throws herself on the ground. Like, Honey, you can. Can't never could. So you might as well believe that you can. Huh? That you can do all things, like the Bible says, through the Christ who strengthens you. I was reading in the book of nine, nine, 
Mark 9, 23. That's a sign and a wonder right there because I, I, I know what I read, but I don't always know the address. And so I was reading that, and I was reading a passage of Scripture where Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he's also speaking to a large group of people, and they're just hanging on every word that he's saying. And I love what Jesus said because the reason it stood out to me, because I was reading this, and I had just read Philippians 4.13, where the Bible says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. This is Paul giving us that revelation. But now we go into the book of Mark, chapter 9, and Jesus speaks to the, to the crowd, and he says this. He says, all things are possible to those who believe. And I thought, man, that sounds like what I just read on the other side of the Bible. And I realized that God doesn't really, re doesn't really need your service. He'll take your service, but he doesn't need it. God doesn't need your leadership. God doesn't need your influence. God doesn't need your planning. But he does make it an absolute requirement to have your belief. You must believe. Without belief, this promise of the living God is just nullified. Is that a word? I think I've I read it somewhere. I think it's a word. Listen, you have to believe. You have to believe that God can do the impossible through, through, through a limited vessel like you. I was born with certain limitations. There's propensity. You know, I am not like, uh, like Kelly's husband, you know, Mr. Neubauer, who was born with absolutely no limitations. I, on the other hand, like most of us, was born with some limitations, I, I was born with propensities. Largely, I, I am the way that I am, largely because my father was the way that he was. And I, I look the way that I look, largely because my father looked the way that he looked. And so it's probably clear to most of you that I'm not going to be struggling with anorexia anytime real soon. <laughs> and that, and that <laughs> sometimes I make myself laugh. <laughs> that was funny, Frank. That was funny right there. How'd you come up with that? <laughs> it's, it's obvious that the NBA is not going to be calling me anytime soon and offering me a recruiting contract, okay? I understand that. But I think what most of us ignore within the Christian community is that when you're born again, you are now assimilated into a divine gene pool that has absolutely no limitations, that you can do all things through Christ Jesus. So through the process of assimilation, you have to recognize that if there is divine healing, if there's healing in the, in the nature of my Father up in heaven, then there's healing readily available to both you and me. That if salvation is part of the genetic makeup of my heavenly Father, then I have salvation readily available to both you and I. That if there is joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and goodness available or in the nature of my heavenly Father, then there is love and patience and goodness and kindness also embedded within the DNA of my personal nature through the process of adoption and inheritance. You can do all things through the Jesus who strengthens you. A divine gene pool. Listen, people have been doing the impossible for a real long time. It's the, for a real long time, people have been doing things that they were never supposed to be able to do unless they did it with the strength of their Heavenly Father. When shepherds, when shepherds slay giants, when teenage boys slay well-oiled trained warriors, When, 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 when slaves, when slaves lead an exodus out of the world power of, Egypt, of the Egyptians by the millions, you understand? When tax collectors, just, tax collectors were so hated in the Bible, but the, when tax collectors began to pray for the sick, and the sick began to recover, and they understand that there's nothing good inside of them, but now God who's strengthening them is allowing them to do the things that they could never do on their own. When fishermen began to walk on water, therefore they find the very laws of nature. When a woman that was possessed by seven demons, Mary Magdalene, becomes the first one. Listen, this chick had seven demons in her. 
You understand? Once bad enough, listen, I have been in a situation where I understand what spiritual warfare is. I have woken up with demonic presence. I, I, I've been under the, the, uh, the attack of demonic oppression. There's no way I could ever be demon-possessed because the spirit of the living God lives inside of me, and he doesn't check up with anybody. Huh? So, so it's, it's, I'm just saying, he doesn't. That doesn't happen. But that doesn't mean that you're exempt from the attack of the enemy. I've actually literally laid in bed and have woken up during a very dark time in my life where I had sensed a demonic uh, attack on my own personal spiritual life. And I remember waking up one day being choked by a demon. And I know that sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, I woke up. Every hair on my body was standing up. I had more hair back then. I mean, I remember I had like, I felt cold. And for the first time in my life, I felt the very essence of fear. And I tried to speak, and I couldn't because the air was being sucked out of my lungs. And when I finally got enough air in my lungs to scream out the only thing I needed to scream out, which was the name of Jesus, I felt this demonic presence leave from the head, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I was on a waterbed, and even the water level was raised because this thing had weight to it. This is just one little thing trying to attach itself to me. But the Bible says that this chick had seven demons inside of her. And she becomes the very first woman. Not just the very first woman, but the very first person who will trumpet the message that sets us apart from everybody else and every other faith and every other religion in the world. When she looked in the tomb and recognized that it was empty, and she goes and tells everybody, Jesus is no longer dead, but he lives, he lives, and he lives. Huh? <laughs> Unlikely characters. Unlikely characters doing unlikely things, just regular people. When whores become the prime example of what worship is supposed to, it was intended to look like, when she breaks the alabaster box of the master's feet and gives all that she had in a public setting, that is an unlikely character. When regular, ordinary men and women become apostolic porch, porches, torches, huh? allowing their light to shine not only in their generation, but in the next generation, and then the next generation, and then also stepping into the chron throughout the chronicles of time into eternity, um, this gives the devil a black eye. It's like giving the devil a bloody lip because he looks at somebody that he intended to fail. He says, that person, I set him up in such a way that they were going to fail. But the devil fails to recognize that some people actually read their Bibles. And when they read their Bibles, they read the promises that are available to us. And like the Apostle Paul say, they don't just hear it and then go off with their merry way. But they do that which they have heard. And when somebody reads their Bible and says that I can do all things through the Christ who strengthens us, those words, I can, are full of endless possibilities. Unlikely characters. Regular, ordinary teenagers. Huh? Women. Regular people. Tax collectors. Fishermen. People that have been disenfranchised by the world people that should have never amounted to anything with that divorce in your life you should have never been given a chance to be a husband or a wife again or a parent but you did because all things are possible to those who believe with that alcoholism in your rear view mirror, you should have never been able to go through the transformation of your personal metamorphosis into freedom, but you did because all things are possible to them that believe. With that drug addiction in your past, you should have never experienced deliverance or are experiencing deliverance, but you did because all things are possible to those who believe. With that verbal and that sexual and that physical and that emotional abuse, you should have never been able to grow up and be a fully healthy, functioning adult. 
He should have grown up to need so much therapy that it would have taken a part-time job to pay for the couch time that you were, you would have needed. But an encounter with Jesus changed everything, and now you're functioning, huh? Come on now. Sometimes we need to listen. Sometimes we need to drop the F word into the devil, and we need to say, "I'm still functioning, devil," huh? I, I know, I know you, you got me real messed up and then you got me involved with these people and then you got me involved with that, with that substance. But guess what? Fun, fun, functioning. <laughs> oh, it's being recorded. I got to be careful. I'm stepping on thin eyes here. Huh? But sometimes you got to look at the devil and say, listen, dude, I'm still functioning. I'm still functioning as a father. I'm still functioning as a husband. I'm still functioning as a Christian. I may not be perfect all the time, but I'm functioning and I'm not going under because all things are possible to those that believe. All things, all things to everybody, teenagers, to kids, to adults, huh? Fat people, skinny people, good looking people, everybody. <laughs> You're functioning. Because all things are possible to those that believe. And the moment you stop believing, it's the moment that you have just walked through the gate of defeat. And the only thing you got to do is you can't look at what the song that we sung. Don't look at the mountain. Don't, it's, it's him. It's not, it's not you anyway. But don't let the mountain affect your belief. Yesterday I saw, I saw a woman... Um, and she was, <laughs> my Lord, I mean, she was carrying an O2 tank with oxygen being pumped into her nose with a really cool pink do-rag, I'm sure, in order to hide the consequence of the chemo where she had lost her hair and smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if there was ever a clue that you should probably consider quitting Maybe the O2 tank would have given it away. Huh? And I couldn't help but to think that she has lost her belief that she can quit. Well, listen, don't feel bad if you smoke. I know half people, half of you smoke. I know you do. I don't think smoking is a sin, to be honest with you. I think it's a bad habit. I don't think it's a sin. I saw my mother tell me all my life, I can't quit smoking. I can't quit smoking. I can't quit smoking. I can't, I can't, I can't. Can't, never could. And then I saw her get pregnant with my sister. We're 19 years apart. And guess who quit smoking for nine months? Huh? Because, hey, listen. You won't do it for yourself or you'll do it for somebody else. Because you have faith to believe that God can do something great in the life of somebody else. But God forbid, God looks at you and you recognize the fact that God actually thinks you're awesome. Because we're so busy looking at the things that we fail at that we forget about the fact that we've been created in His image and in His likeness and God can do all things through Christ who will give us the strength to do it. And so remember that when you're born again, you're now assimilated into a gene pool, a divine gene pool that has no, no no, nothing is beyond the realm of the impossible. Your marriage might be in a real difficult place, but it is not beyond the realm of impossibility. You might be sick of being sick, but it's your sickness is not beyond the realm of impossibility. That thing, drug addiction, whatever, is trying to hang on to you. I'm telling you, and you think that there's no way out. It is not beyond the realm of impossibility because all things are possible. And now you have just been assimilated into a divine gene pool that has no limitations. So what's the one thing you have stopped believing God for? Hmm? The ushers, the camera, the music, the musicians are all evidence that my time is done. <laughs> and I can't seem to stop talking. <laughs> so let me, let me do this. My pastor, Pastor John at the Methodist Church, where I was at before, <laughs> he used to tell me, I saw so many great opportunities for you to exit. And you just wouldn't. <laughs> He just kept on driving. <laughs> the road's gone. You're like, you're not even on a four-wheel drive, but you just keep driving through. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on driving. I don't care. 
Will you bow your heads and your hearts with me? Will you take a moment and, and, and ask Jesus that question? Come on, what's the, what's the one thing you stopped believing for, but you got up on Sunday morning and you attended church and God wants to remind you, if you can muster enough faith to believe for that one thing again, you're going to see me do what you thought would be impossible in your life. That's the word from the Lord. Listen, I need to say that again. Whatever one thing that you feel like you're on the verge of stopping to believe for, or maybe you have already stopped believing for, this Sunday morning, would you allow God to elevate the level of your faith again to be able to believe for the impossibilities? And then you're going to stand up here when we have a testimony service and you're going to give God all the glory because you know that this thing that God gave you the faith to believe for was accomplished by Him and by Him alone. Whether it's something in your personal life or whether you're believing something for a family member or a son or a daughter or a friend or a parent. Just take a few moments and just ask the Holy Spirit. How many people with your heads bowed and your eyes closed would say, I have something I stopped believing for and I think God is highlighting that thing in my soul today and, that, and he wants to, for me to have faith to believe that he can do that. Let, will you raise your hand and let me see if that's you. I see you. I see. Okay, I'm just going to stop counting. You can put your hands down. Father, I pray for everybody who raised their hand, Lord. I ask God that this morning that you would do the supernatural, that you would begin to elevate the level of their faith to be able to believe that things are not beyond the realm of the impossibility and that you can do that which you said you will do, which is the impossible, Lord. So, Father, would you take a moment right now and just take about 30 seconds and just pray for whatever thing you just raised your hand for. I want you to connect with God and make that connection because I'm not going to be with you when you wake up on Monday morning, but the Holy Spirit will be, God's word will be, and, and, and then he'll remind you of what happened this morning. So will you just pray for a few moments on your own? Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. I thank you that you still speak, Lord. I thank you, Father. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. As you're praying, with your head still bowed and your eyes closed, I would need to ask a question that was asked of me when I was just a 17-year-old teenager. And if the pastor did not ask that question, I don't think I would have ever been called into accountability to answering it. And the question is basically this. There is no sin allowed in heaven. And if you are living in sin that you have not asked for forgiveness for, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so that heaven could be your home. If you want to be forgiven of sin today so that heaven can be your home, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now so I can pray for you. See your hand, bro. See your hand. See your hand, hand, hand. Little ones, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Put your hands down. Let me pray for you. Dear Jesus, I pray that you will forgive, Lord, the sin that is there in order to keep us from living the life that you intended us to live. I speak forgiveness. I speak freedom. And I speak joy over all those who raise their hands. Can we do it? Can we pray that prayer together? Will you just repeat after me? Most of you, a lot of you raise your hands, but if you did not raise your hand, let's repeat this together. Hi, and let's take ownership of this word. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Give me this day new life, new joy, new peace, and save for me a place in heaven when I die but allow me to live in the fullness of freedom on this earth until that day in Jesus name I pray amen amen would you give Jesus a hand come on it's a big deal